I want to turn over the introduction to, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read one verse. Revelation chapter 18, and in verse 4, and as you know, the setting, you know, we as in God's people, we, you know, our focus is on desiring and wanting God's kingdom to come. Then, you know, when we see the stresses and the things going on in the world, we wonder when his kingdom is going to come, what we might be going through. And, you know, it's, it's on our mind, you know. It's, we, we wonder about it, and sometimes we can be concerned. And God gives us a warning over in verse 4 of Revelation 18, as Mr. Ekema touched on a little bit, and talking about coming out of this world, out of the society of this world, and talking about the time of the tribulation, of a time that is going to be so devastating, pain and suffering and death, to the extent that it has never been ever in the history of this world. And we can go back and we can look at that, the wars and the pain and all the Holocaust, everything, Mussolini. There's a time coming. So sometimes it does weigh on us and we wonder. And Jesus Christ through John says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of this society. The society that we live in. He says, Lest you share in her sins. And lest you receive of her plagues. So, whether we, the tribulation comes in our lifetime or not, you know, it's something that is on our mind. It's been on a number of people's minds in the writings of this book. And as we heard in the first message, whether it is not or is in this lifetime, we have to be focusing on our life and putting sin out of our life. And if that's the case... You know, we can be part of the family of God that we're all seeking, his kingdom, which we are desiring, which we're supposed to be a part of living right now. And it does talk about, you know, to touch on, you can look it up, Isaiah 52, verse 11, Jeremiah 51, starting in verse 45, where that remnant, if the tribulation comes in our lifetime or when it comes, there's a remnant that is taken into a place of safety that they are protected. Because... They are putting sin out of their life. They're not letting it ensnare them or hold them back. And so we know that we are warned and so that there should not be any surprises if we get caught off guard. So the question is, as we continue from the first message, you know, what is, what is your identity? You know, what is my identity? Who are we? Who are we supposed to be? How do people see us? Do we represent God? You know, are we of Babylon? Or is that what we represent? Or do we represent the new Jerusalem of what is to come and what we are to be? You know, in society today, anything that this world does is contrary to what God wants them to do. You know, as an example, God tells us to be so, you know, be so thoughtful of his word and to do exactly as he says. And Deuteronomy chapter 15 talks a little bit about, you know, what Israel the tribes of Israel, the laws that God gave them, what they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to live, loving Him, loving God, that way of life, so that they could have a relationship with other people and, and implement what God was trying to portray to them of a life of giving of themselves, of serving others, is having the right attitude. And we don't have that in society today. You know? That rubber band you know, for the society, when it collapses, when it just comes down, as we, 
read in Revelation, you can keep reading through there, it's going to happen quick, it's going to happen fast. And we can look at the United States and look at the world. Not all societies are in debt, but there's a lot of debt. And we, of the United States, are part of the tribes of Israel. And pick it up in chapter 15 of Deuteronomy. It says in verse 1, At the end of every seven years you shall grant a release of debts. Well, we, you know, we hate, we, our society, our economy is based on debt, more debt, more debt, trade debt. And, and this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. So God has a plan, an economic plan of how we are to be living and trading in verse 3, of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall not give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there, when there may be no poor among you. For the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess as an inheritance. So he's telling Israel, this is how you're supposed to live. Don't be charging interest to your brother. And at the same time, at the, Look at what your brother's getting himself into. Should, you know, loaning, giving, it's, it's helping. It's having that concern. And also at the same time, when they can't pay that debt, it gets released on that seventh year. But to others, foreigners, you can loan to them and you can charge them interest. <laughs> All right, we as a society have not done that. And I think what is interesting is verse 5. As God reiterates only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today not just this one but carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with all the deserve with care all these commandments which I command you today for the Lord your God will bless you just as he has promised you So with that in mind, of being careful about what we do and how we live, based on God's word, I'd like to continue the message from what Mr. Ekema had started on. He had five examples. I touch on one main one and touch on a couple of others. But the title I've titled the message is Living Godly in an Ungodly World. And we can ask ourselves, what citizenship are we of? Are we of Babylon or are we of Jerusalem above? And we can answer that question on how we are living today. Just as Israel was called out of bondage, we are called to come out of bondage. And just as we heard in the first message, we don't want to go back into it. We need to be coming out of it. As 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. So before we were called, we were ignorant, just like the world is ignorant what they're going through right now. And we're told, Peter tells us, don't go back into it. We're not ignorant anymore. We have the understanding. We have God's Holy Spirit. So we're to come out of today's culture, the society, the world, and not fall back into it. You know, and we can remember, we focus on, some of us have been recently baptized, some it's been a while back. But as John talks through the inspired word of Jesus Christ in Revelation, talking about the churches in Revelation chapter 2, where Jesus Christ is telling us, because we have different attitudes, different things that we're going through in our lives, you know, struggles with sin, and as we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 15, 5 and 6, we need to carefully examine the Word of God and take His instruction and implement it into our lives perfectly. But 
he tells us when he's going through the churches that you're obeying this, you're doing this, you're doing this right, but I still have something against you. At one point he says, you know, go back to your first love. Go back to your first love. And I know I talked about this before, and we talk about this a lot, and we can reckon a lot, you know, focus and, and think on what did I do? What was my first love? Remember when God called us? You know, we couldn't get enough of it. As we heard in the first message, these individuals, they repented. They, when they saw that they were wrong, when we saw that we were wrong, we listened. We wanted to get more. What else is there that you want to show us? When God shows us sin, he wants us to look at it as ugly. And we want to change. And knowing that we can't do it on ourselves, we need help. We have that process of the Holy Spirit. So that focus is we can ask ourselves, am I changing when I'm told I'm wrong? There's an amazing example in the Bible, someone that I just, it's like, wow. I mean, I saw, you know, we're not supposed to compare ourselves with individuals. You know, Jesus Christ is the ultimate example. But there's a time when Israel was taken into captivity. We have Judah taken into captivity. And Nebuchadnezzar, you know, the king, I want your children. I want your young men. I want those who are close to you. I want those that are without blemish, that are good looking. And I want them. And we'll pick up that story here in just a little bit. I'm talking about Daniel, who as a young age obeyed God. You know, Daniel was a man of God in the midst of an ungodly society. We can, as we go through Daniel, I'm going to look at some examples of this individual who lived godly in an ungodly society and see what we can glean to help us in our pursuit and coming out of Babylon to enter into the new Jerusalem. And we can look at what did Daniel do? What didn't he do? And what did God do for him? So today I have three points that we need to be addressing now in our lifetime as we are living in an ungodly society. Number one is stay true to who you are. Number one is stay true to who you are. And I just want to read to you Romans chapter 12, 2. Well, let's read starting in verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, Paul here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We are to be a living sacrifice. We can ask ourselves, am I a living sacrifice? Holy and acceptable to God. If we're holding on to sin, we're not holy and acceptable to God. Which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, as it says in verse 2. But it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So our mind needs to be transformed. We cannot be doing this on our own. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, we're told, Paul tells us over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16, to not lose heart, that we're supposed to be renewed day by day, throughout the day. And we can, as we go through these examples of Dan Daniel, that's what he did. That's what he did. His source was God. Jesus Christ tells us in the New Testament that he is the living bread, and that's what we are to seek. The Gentiles, those who do not know God's way of life, they seek a different way. We're called to come out of that. They seek for themselves the riches of society, things for themselves. And we're told to, to get that focus off ourselves. And when we focus on the things of ourselves and what we can get and what we can do and what we're doing in our pursuits of life, we worry, as we'll talk about here in a little bit. Now let's turn over to Daniel chapter 
chapter 1, as we'll see that Nebuchadnezzar tried changing Daniel. And we have Satan who's trying to change us to not conform to God and his ways. Daniel chapter 1, and verse 4. Talks about Dan, and verse one is talking about you know Nebuchadnezzar, how he's overtaken Judah into captivity, brought him into his kingdom, and in verse four, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was looking for children in whom there was no blemish, but well favored and skilled in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and as such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans were astrologers, magicians, the wise individuals. And here, Nebuchadnezzar was wanting to change these individuals to conform to his way of life. And we know that Satan pushes that on us too. He wants to change our thinking, what we stand for our thoughts, our pursuits. And they also, in verse 7, they changed his name to Belteshazzar. And Daniel's name means God is my judge. But they changed his name to the God Baal, after the God Baal. As, and Baal, they said, no, Baal, this God, he's your provider of life. So they changed his name. And also his diet, in verse 5, back up, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, and at the end thereof they might stand before the king. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat or with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile Himself, I don't want to sin. Here he's in a kingdom that is not living to God's standards. He's been put into bondage. And now he's forced to change. To save his life. And he does not yield. And again, what does Daniel focus on that we just read over in Deuteronomy chapter 15? He's careful in keeping God's commandments. He's careful, very careful, to observe all those things, those commandments which God commands. And he trusted in God. He said, if I do that, God is going to bless me. And Daniel's focus was on the new Jerusalem. It was focused on that kingdom. It was not focused on his life. And Daniel knew it was important for him to not eat this food. Whether it was common or uncommon, he said, I do not want to be defiled. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 14, 3 says, talking about the food laws, you shall not eat any detestable thing. We're required to, to, to not eat any detestable thing. You know, Satan wants to change our name. He wants us to follow him, to live to him, not to God. You know, sometimes, you know, after we've been in the church a period of time, we can go to a restaurant and, you know, some of us, you know, it's like, don't ask if there's lard in that. Don't ask. Well, God says, you shall not eat any detestable thing. I think we need to be more focused. When we go into a restaurant, ask. What you don't know won't hurt you. Well, what we don't know, if we can try to know, will hurt us. We should have the attitude, I do not want to eat anything like that. So I think, what is our identity? Daniel stood up, I 
want to obey God. He was following what God had told Israel over in Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 15 to be very careful about obeying the voice of God. So just some things that we can focus on ourselves and we look at Daniel. One thing after another he was tested. And just because we pass a test doesn't mean the tests are over. The test tests kept coming. And, and Daniel obeyed God. And what did God do for Daniel? Verse 9, And God gave Daniel favor. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So God was taking care of him. God was guiding him and working with him. And other people there were giving favor. They didn't understand, but God is the one who's in charge, and he gives, and he can do that in our lives. We stand up for truth. We stand up for righteousness. We don't want to give in. I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to keep the holy days. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. If a job is in jeopardy or a new job is, stand up for what is right. Do we have faith in God? Daniel had faith in God. Choose carefully. What do we believe in? What do we stand for? Are we timid? Are we afraid? God isn't going to work with us. He's there for us. He tells us he's there for us. We just have to have faith. How do we get that faith? We can pray and ask for more faith. So Danny was a, a man of God and he was not going to give in. I mean, I look at that and it's like, wow. <laughs> wow. In verse 10, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king. I fear King Nebuchadnezzar if I don't do what he asks. Who hath appointed your, he has appointed your meat and your drink, for why should, you see, why should he see your faces worse lightning than the children which are of your sort? Then shall he make me endangered of my head to the king. I'm the one who's responsible. It's pagan practices, whatever that may be, whatever type of food it was. David, not David, Daniel did not want to defile himself. He did not want to lose his identity. He took action. And then Daniel said to Melzar in verse 11, verse 12, we see that he was respectful, see that he was going to offer a plea. He was not going to give in, just as we're told, very carefully. To obey the commandments of God, and I will bless you. Daniel 12, prove, Daniel says, prove your servants, I beseech you. So here he's saying, hey, I beseech you, this is what I want to do, this is what I need to do. Please don't think of yourself having your neck dead, I beseech you. Just 10 days, and let and give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then our, our countenances be examined. Look at us. Look how we'll look. Look how we'll be. And the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's delicacies, and you will see fit deal with your servants. So compare us with those who are eating those, that food compared to what we're eating here. You know, some people say, well, it could have been pastries and all these different things, and there's rich foods, and that's what's going to, uh, you know, and we, we, we do feel sluggish and we eat things like that. But Daniel was, knew that he didn't want to defile himself, and whatever this food was, he wanted to obey God. And verse 14, so he consented to them in this matter, and he proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. And thus Milzer took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink, and he gave them vegetables. He rewarded vegetables, grains. So we see here that Daniel was a man of God, and he was not going to give in. Now what would have happened if Milzer would not have yielded, but he obeyed God. You know, he would have probably, I know he would have stood firm his ground and because we recognize and see through the other examples that will come through that he would obey God no matter what. But as he was obeying God, God gave him favor. 
you know, he negotiated, as we see here. He, he had skills of negotiating. He didn't come out here and, you know, and just in a huff. You know, he was delicate. Um, he had wisdom, he had tact, and he showed respect. This is, and we can do that in this society that we live in, too. We live in an ungodly society, and we can be godly in this society. And continuing on in verse 17, we can see what more did God do for them as they continued to obey. Also talking about Daniel's friends. And verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So God, God is there for us. He tells us he's there for us. He says, seek the living bread. Sometimes we want to go out and solve things in our lives, and we go about it the wrong way. Well, our focus needs to be on trusting in God, and, and God will provide. God says he will. We just got to step out in faith and let him work it out. So our challenge is to stay true to our identity. And as we obey, we'll continue to be tested, which leads us to point number two. Number two is God needs to be our source, always. God will always needs to be our source. And chapter two of Daniel you know, we, those who, I think most of us know the story, of Nebuchadnezzar having the dream, and he wanted that dream to be interpreted, but he wasn't going to tell his dream to anyone. You're going to interpret what I dreamed. Tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what the dream means. And here's all these wise men, all these individuals that were teaching and training Daniel and his friends. They said, as you go through that story, that there's no one of physical means that can tell you that dream. None of us are able to do that. And so a decree, uh, a decree goes out. The king becomes very angry. And he says that all you wise men are dead. He just, boop. And he sends out men, in verse 13, and the, the, the decree went out, and that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his companions to be slain. So what did Daniel do? He just continued obeying God. Verse 14, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of, the ba of Babylon. And we can see here what Daniel also didn't do, his reaction. Now, he had just been promoted into the kingdom. You go through the story. He could have got on, you know, on his knees and said, God, I'm obeying you. What are you doing this to me now for? Why this? Why me? What, what do I need to learn in life? I mean, here's an individual that lived in a society that had a king that just, he just made him mad. He'd say, you're dead. Oh, you're dead over here. You're dead over, you know, he, I mean, it was just, they didn't fear the king. They gave the king respect, but they obeyed God, and God gave them the comfort. God said, I will bless you. Be careful how you choose to obey my commandments. I mean, that's what I get out of this. Something I need and we all need to be focusing on and the things that we do in our lives. He didn't go to God and say, why this now? He just continued. He knew that God was in charge of his life. And we can focus on that too. And so Daniel says, verse 15, he answered and said to the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? And Daniel went in and to the king as he, verse 16, they would give him time and that he would show the king's interpretation of the dream. So Daniel had faith. I'm obeying God. 
God will provide. It's one thing that I get out of this as well. We obey God. We're seeking to obey God in all his ways. We don't try to justify or cover it up and say, oh, that is too hard. Guess what? It is too hard if we rely on ourselves. You can go through the book of Daniel. As his custom was, he prayed. As his custom was, he prayed to God. He went to God for everything. He prayed to God throughout the day, as we'll touch on here in just a minute. In verse 16, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king's interpretation of the dream. And then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to his four friends, his three friends. And that they would, verse 18, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So they went to God. They didn't complain. They didn't murmur. They went, discussed it. We need to pray to God and go to Him. And that's, when, they, when we're obeying God and living His way of life, and that's the right attitude, it's easier to be able to do that. It becomes us. We just need to get over seeking our will and yielding to God and having that right attitude of, hey, where else am I wrong? What else do I need to do? Show me more. I want to do more. We couldn't get enough when we first learned the truth. And that's how we're still supposed to be, that right attitude, and just continuing marching down those steps, marching up those steps. And then again, what, well, what did God do for them? They continued this process, this continued process of obeying God. And what does God do? Verse 19, and then the secret revealed was revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And then what did Daniel do? He blessed God. He gave him thanks. He didn't become haughty. He didn't rise up and say, wow, I'm the one who gets all this. He didn't get a big head. He stayed focused. And that brings us into point number three. He remained humble. He never lifted himself up and said, Wow, I am all it. God is working with me. He's given me all this information. You know, when he went before the king, it was God can reveal this. God will do this. He gave credit to God. And he found favor with the head people. And his, compa- his companions that were in the world despised Daniel and his friends. And Daniel, you can read chapter 2, 20 through 23, where Daniel gives God credit in the prayer. Thank you. Thank you. In another test, Daniel chapter 6, we're just talking about these individuals, these people that saw that Daniel was getting this credit from the king. They plotted against Daniel, but as you go through chapter 6, you see that they could find nothing wrong in Daniel, that he was faithful. That means he obeyed the law of the land. So they had to come up with something else they could tack on him into where they know that Daniel for certain would not heed the king. If the king said anything that went contrary to God, they knew that Daniel wouldn't obey the king. Because they knew that he was obedient to his God. And he was. Daniel was not about to change. As they made this law that you could not pray to anyone 
you know, except to the king or as God. And what did Daniel do? That decree went out? As his custom was. In verse 10 of chapter 6, he prayed as his custom was. Didn't matter. I'm going to obey God and be careful. He didn't say, okay, what am I going to do this time, God? You know, I just, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with you for the last long time. 30 days should be okay. I just don't want to lose my life. Satan does push us to get our focus off obeying God. Our focus, I look at Daniel and it's like, what an example, what an amazing example, an example that I fall so short in, things that I need to do and refocus and dedicate myself to be careful in all of God's commandments. Daniel didn't work it out himself. He just did as his custom was, and he went and he prayed to his God. And that day he prayed three times. I like the example of David, you know, in seeking humility and where we're at, where we are at in our life and what he came to understand. And Psalm 56, verse 3, I'd like to read it to you. David says, whenever I am afraid, whenever I'm afraid. I'm not saying that we can't be afraid. Because we're human beings. Things happen. It flashes. It says, I will trust in you. Verse 4. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. You know, we can, that fear comes about. We get on our knees, or if we have, don't have the opportunity to get on our knees, we can refocus ourselves, and God, give me that strength to do what is right. God says, you obey me, I will comfort you. And he does. He says, what flesh can do to me? What can flesh do to me, David says? All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. Satan is going to do whatever he can to thwart us. And we live in a society that's all around us. It's all around us. And if we get caught up into the world, caught up into society, we can falter and we can have unbelief. We can worry. As Paul says over in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12, Paul says, To be aware of a heart of unbelief. He says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. I think that's amazing. What he's saying is, Be aware lest we have an evil heart of unbelief because we're departing from the living God and doing what he says. Verse 13, obey. He's talking about obeying his laws while it is called today. We have the opportunity now. We're being judged now. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulnesses of sin. So if we're not getting on our knees and crying out to God and asking for guidance, asking for help, asking for change to help me to have that first love, help me to yield to you. Give me the strength to stand up and do what is right. You know, God is the one who gives us this belief. As in, in closing, I think, as Paul, over in 1 Timothy, talks about his faith, his obedience to God, we need to be doing the same thing. Having these same thoughts, these same things that we do in our life, these reasonings, why do I suffer? I mean, we live in Satan's society. But we need to be asking for help so we can be godly in an ungodly society. As he's talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, 
Paul's talking about. He shares here, for the reasons that I suffer, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, who's strengthened me, who's given me the comfort, who's helped me. Why? Because he has counted me faithful. Paul sought God's ways. He did not want to disobey. He wanted to live by every word. He didn't compromise. And he put him into the ministry, as it says there. And he held fast to Jesus Christ. He held fast to that faith. Verse 13, though, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an, a violent man, but he says, I obtained mercy. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly, meaning he didn't know, but now he does know. Verse 13, you want to keep, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. We want to keep that Holy Spirit. We want to keep doing godly deeds with faith and love which are in Jesus Christ, as he was encouraging Timothy here. This is what we need to be doing. This is how we need to be living. Satan wants us to doubt. Satan wants us to go a different direction. But we are being tested. We are being given an opportunity to be a part of the new Jerusalem above, to come out of Babylon, to come out of this society. Satan doesn't want us to rely on God's promises. He wants us to uh, just go with the flow, even if it's just a little bit. That's enough. He wants us to be focused and concerned on ourselves, and that way does not work. David said in Psalm 119, 119, 165, as David living to God and wanting to be at peace, he says, Great peace will come to those who love God's law. Great peace will come to those who love God's law. And soundness comes to those and nothing causes them to stumble. So if we take these words literally, if we're obeying God and seeking God's way of life and using that gift of repentance, we're not going to stumble. We'll be comforted. Nothing causes them to stumble. We can say, wow. I mean, that's what... We're being told here, obey God and follow me and I'll take care of you. You will not stumble. So number one, let's not lose our identity of who we are, of what we become, of what we dedicated ourselves to God and our covenant contract with him. And remember that God needs to be our source. Always. Always. And continue to seek humility and we need to continue to be humble. So let's live godly in an ungodly society. Let's come out of Babylon. Let's be living and seeking that new Jerusalem. And remember the examples of Daniel, of how he lived, of how he lived to God, of what he would do, what he wouldn't do, and what God did for him. And if we are living to God, we will not have to fear, no matter what happens. God gives us that promise. And as we're seeking that kingdom, as we're seeking that new Jerusalem, you can look it up later in Luke chapter 12 and verse 32, as Jesus Christ gives an outline of Give up on focusing on yourself. Focus on keeping the commandments and what I can do for you. And don't be seeking your will to which results, which results in worrying. But he says, I'm here for you. And in closing, he says in Luke 12, verse 32, he says, Do not fear, little flock, for, as your father, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem.